welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Tonight, as you grab your Bibles, go with me to the book of Psalms. We're going to be in Psalms chapter number 15. And I want to talk to you tonight about a, a message called Living a Life of Honor. Living a Life of Honor. In Psalms chapter number 15, we find a, a, a great psalm. Actually, if you want to just read the whole thing sometime, just mark it in your Bible and go sit down and read it. Really encourage you and really bless you. Psalm chapter number 15, we're going to read verse number 1 and actually go through verse Number two, Psalm chapter 15, verse number one and verse number two, we find these words. It says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, in your tent, in your dwelling place, Lord? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Verse number two, he answers the question that he asked in verse number one. He says, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Now, we see that there are some character qualities. He goes on throughout the psalm, and like I said, when you have some time, read it on your own because it really gets into some things and, and, and has some things that will encourage you and bless you and build your life for the things of God. But in verse number two, he outlines a couple of things that I want to take a look at for a moment. Notice there's a progression. There's something that's going on, something that's taking place. This is an active person. This is not a person sitting idly by and just waiting for dew drops from heaven to bless them hoping that God will sprinkle some magic dust on them and maybe there will be some blessings that shower down out of that or some goodness that comes out of that. No, this is a person that is active. This is a person that is doing. Take a look at what they're doing. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Now, I wish we had time to get into what all that means, but tonight I really want to pull out a couple of things because remember, we're talking about living a life of honor. Talking about living a life that, number one, honors God, but also we want to get tonight into the practical areas of honor, which is honoring other people, honor in our, in our relationships, honor in, in our work habits, honor in the things that we do. And, and, and so I wanted to point out a couple of words in verse number two. Notice I've got it up on the overhead. It says, he who walks. Everybody say, who walks. Walk. Anytime you see the word walks in the Bible, you could write in the words next to it in your Bible, lives out life. Really, when you see that somebody is walking in a certain way, that's why the Bible says walk in the Spirit or live out your life. How? In the Spirit. You are to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible also tells us that we are supposed to walk in love. What does that mean? Live out a life of love. So right here it says, who can dwell with God? He who walks uprightly. Somebody who walks in a manner that is upright, the right way with God. And look at what it says, and works. Everybody say works. works. Works righteousness or does things God's will, God's way. It's both a position, yes, but it's also a practice in our life. And finally it says, and speaks. Everybody say speaks. Speaks, speaks the truth where? In his, in his heart. I find three areas that if we're going to take a look at a life of honor, there are three areas tonight that we're going to take a look at. But from this verse, we can see from the word walks, works, and speaks in his heart. There are three areas that if we're going to live a life of honor, we have to examine. I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll examine them individually. The first one is publicly. He who walks uprightly. See, there's a public life of honor that we're going to have to live. There's, there's a way that we're going to live with people who are outside of ourselves. You're going to encounter people each and every day. I heard a stat one time. I'm not sure where it came from, but... In any event, it was pretty amazing to hear that the most introverted person in their lifetime will come in contact with or will affect 10,000 people. The most introverted person. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. So you may be introverted. You may be somebody who's an extrovert. You may be out there, you know, going crazy, ah, you know, just talking to people and mixing it up and that sort of a thing. But even if you're an introverted person, you are not an island. You're going to come into contact with other people somehow in some way. So there's a public life. There's also, secondly, works righteousness. There is a professional life. There's a life you're going to have to live on the job. We are in a society that in order to make money, you have to work. That's just how it is. You know, the Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. So you're going to have to 
work. You're going to have to do something. God gave man a job in the garden before he gave him a wife. So we should be working. We should be doing. Jesus said, my father's been working and I've been working. Man, even though there was that Sabbath rest, we've been at work. We've been doing something. And now we're supposed to imitate our father. So we should be beings that work. And so we are to work righteousness, we saw in the verse, but also if we're going to live a life of honor, we're going to have to work in our professional life in a way that is honoring, honoring to God, and honoring we'll find with other people that we work with as well tonight. Finally, there's a, a, a third area, and that is privately or personally, you could say. So you got publicly, you got professionally, and now personally. There's a, a private life, an inner life. He who speaks truth where? In his heart. See, there is a personal and a, a private life that each and every one of us live. And we can choose to live in a life, way that our life is honorable, or we can choose in our private life to live in a way that is dishonorable. We make the choice. We can speak the truth in our heart, or we can deceive ourselves and try and deceive others. And even though we may succeed in deceiving ourselves, we may succeed in deceiving some others, you will never deceive God. Why? Because God sees the secret hidden things of the heart. And God knows exactly where you're at. He knows what you're doing. He knows what's taking place on the inside. God can read the chapters that have been written in the deep recesses of your heart. He knows your number and he knows how to get a hold of you. Hello. And so if we're going to live a life of honor, we're going to have to know how to do this. It'd be one thing to say live it, but quite another thing to say how do we do this. And so tonight we're going to find out how to live a life of honor. These three areas tonight. Anybody want to hear this? Yeah. All right, praise God, I'm glad. How to live a life of honor, number one, publicly. Number one, publicly. Really, like we mentioned before, this is speaking about our relationships. Speaking about coming into contact with other people. Not just being a public figure. You might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not out in the public that much. I'm not a public figure. I just do my thing. I'm by myself. But no, really what we're talking about here is relationships. Turn me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 12. Great Verse in Romans, the 12th chapter. Talking about how to live a life of honor in our relationships publicly. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10 says this. It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Now, take a look at what it says next. It says, in honor, giving preference to one another. Wow. So, right there, he says, I want you to do something. I want you to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That means that as the body of Christ... We are now no longer this family, that family, that tribe, that tribe. No, now we are one. There's no longer, you know, this blood, that blood. There's one blood. It's the blood of Jesus that binds us all together. And therefore, we're all family. Now, I don't know about in your family, but, you know, in my family, there are different personalities. There's different people. There's plenty of opportunities for offense. Anybody else have opportunities for offense in their family? Okay, a couple of you honest people out there. But you know that when you come into contact with your family, there's, there's different people. There's the cool uncle, there's the weird aunt, there's the crazy grandpa, you know. There's all the different people and all these components come together and you guys are knit together by blood. And even though your cousin may have hurt your feelings or your brother turned his back on you or your sister talked about you, you guys never separate, you never stop being family. Why? Because you're family, you're blood, right? Well, in the body of Christ now, God has made us one family. There's now neither Jew nor Scythian, slave nor free, right? There, there, there's none of that anymore. There's not even male or female anymore. Now it's just us, kingdom, body of Christ. We're family. We are the body of Christ. And now in this amazing family, there's plenty of opportunities for offenses. Why? Because there's people that we think are the cool uncle. There's people that we think are the weird aunt. There's the crazy grandpa over there. There's all these different personalities. And then you bring them all together... And what does the Bible have to tell us? It has to tell us to be kindly affectionate to one another. It has to tell us with brotherly love. In other words, even though you may not like the way the person is, they may be that crazy uncle to you, they may be that weird brother, they may be somebody that doesn't fit your personality, you still love them. Why? Because they're your brother in the Lord. They're your sister in the Lord. 
Now you're bound by blood, the blood of Jesus. And how do we do that? We do it in honor. In other words, when you honor somebody, when you give them preference, now, all of a sudden it changes the atmosphere. When you walk in love, maybe tonight you pulled into the parking lot. And as you were pulling into the parking lot, you saw that beautiful spot right there on the front row by the children's ministry because you're going to go drop off your kids. And as you are gracefully turning your steering wheel, going into the spot, somebody pulls in right in front of you. You have an opportunity. Are you going to act honorably and just wave, love you, brother, great spot, I'm glad you got it. Or are you going to act dishonorably and tell them they're number one? (laughs) Giving preference. You come into the church. You go into your normal spot. That's your spot. And as you walk down the aisle, there's someone sitting in your spot. (laughs) That's my spot. What are they doing in my spot? Who said they could sit there? Don't they know that I sit there? I sat there Sunday morning. That's where I sit Sunday night. I mean, I think the church has just come short of putting my name on it on a placard. That's my spot, and they're sitting in my spot. How dare they come earlier than me and sit in my spot? See, you could act dishonorably, give them stink eyes, sit across the sanctuary from them so that you can stare them down the whole message. Or how about this, honorably. Hey, how you doing? Great to see you. I'm so glad you came to church tonight. Hey, what's your name? Hey, what do you do? My goodness, that's so cool. What are your interests? What are your hobbies? Hey, I always sit here. You should sit here with me next time. Actually, that's my seat, but I'll give it to you. (laughs) My new seat will be right next to you now. Giving preference to one another. See, in in our relationships, God wants us to live a life of honor. God wants us to give each other preference. God doesn't want us to act like kids pushing and shoving in line. No, God wants us to love one another and allow the needs of other people in front of our own needs. What is that? That's sacrificial love. That's what Jesus did for you and I. Life that honors God and it honors other people. How about this? 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn there with me. Great verse in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be bouncing around tonight, so just, you know, get as much as you can. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Circle it in your Bible, write a note, bookmark it for later. 1 Peter chapter 2, bless you, the whole church said. <laughs> Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 17. A great verse in First Peter chapter 2, verse number 17. It says these words. It says, honor the people that you like. Is that what your Bible says? Honor the people that fit with your social circles. Honor your Facebook friends. Honor your followers on Twitter. No, it says honor how many people? All All people. Does that include the people you don't like? Does that include the people that rub you the wrong way? Does that include the guy that told you you were number one in the parking lot tonight? Does that include the guy sitting in your seat that you're sitting across the sanctuary from? Yes, Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Honor all people. Look at this. Love the brotherhood. See, we should love each other. With a brotherly love. See, the Bible says that as Christians, we, we are actually to put an extra dose in there. Not just honor. You see, honor all people includes our, our Christian brothers and sisters. But that love, the brotherhood, means that there's an extra over and above amount that we are to feel for one another. My goodness, the church should be the warmest, most inviting, welcoming place on the face of the planet. When people come in here, it should be like a warm tar pit. People just can't get out. They can't get away. If they're going to try and run, they are connected to us. Why? Because we love them. Honor all people. Love 
the brotherhood, fear God. Fear God. What does that mean? Respect him so much that you'll do whatever he says, whenever he says. That you'll tremble at his word and you'll be afraid of offending God. It's a holy reverence. It's an awe and a respect for God. Fear God. And then look at the last one. Honor the king. Now, the king represents the government. I'm going to meddle in your business for a second. Is that okay? Because Peter was writing this. And if you remember with Peter, there was a, a, a king during his days. You can read about it in the book of Acts, Herod Agrippa, he, he killed James, started persecuting the church, saw that it pleased the Jews that he killed James, and now he goes after Peter, throws Peter in jail. He's intending to kill Peter. And if it wasn't for the prayers of the saints, Peter would have been a dead man. But a miraculous thing takes place. He's released from prison. An angel kicks him. Hey, wake up, Peter. Peter gets up. He walks out. The gates open all by themselves. And then Peter stands out there by himself, and he realizes, my goodness, this is not a dream. You know, he's pinching himself. And he writes, these words honor the king. Now, now let's take it to another level. The, the king over all of the Roman Empire at this time, probably at the time of his writing, was Nero. You guys remember Nero? It was, it was rumored that Nero fiddled while Rome was burning, right? This is the same Nero that had his mother executed. What kind of a man executes his mom? This is the same Nero that persecuted Christians had them thrown to the dogs, crucified, and burned. And yet the word of God tells us, honor the king. And yet, we start talking around the coffee pot. We get on our blog. We, we, we talk to other people. Election time comes up, and what do we do? Badmouth the authorities. We don't like the legislation. We don't like how they spent the money. We don't like what they're doing. Now listen, it's fine to disagree but it's not fine to dishonor. Because if they can honor an unjust king that is killing Christians, then we need to pray for our leaders. We need to honor them. And if anybody starts speaking evil, we need to have no part of it. The Bible says that God set those people in that place of authority. And therefore, when you dishonor them in their authority, you are now going against what God is doing on the earth. Therefore, we need to honor the king. Why? Because it brings honor to God. In essence, thank you for letting me meddle in your business. I'm not done, though. You, you clap too soon. You don't have to turn there, but Romans 13, verse 7 in the New Living Translation says, Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes. I'm going to just let that marinate for a second. <laughs> because the Bible does say to pay your taxes. Jesus said, Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Render to God what is God's. Pay your taxes and government fees. Pay those parking tickets. <laughs> to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. See, God wants us to operate in a way that is honoring Him, yes. But also honoring those that are in authority. Honoring those who are leaders. Civilly in our nation, in, in, in our government, in our county, in our city. Yes, even here in San Bernardino. Even though we may not agree with everything that goes on, we still need to respect and honor them. Why? Because this is pleasing to God. This is how God operates. This is what God wants for our lives. Give respect and honor to those who are in authority. How to live a life of honor, number one, publicly. Okay, so what about professionally? What about on the job? What about this second area called professionally, that work that we do? Each and every one of us, even if you don't have a job, you need to listen to this because when you do get a job, because you should be looking for a job, unless you are a, you know, sometimes people have the cop out, well, I stay at home with the kids. Well, that's your job, right? 
And so therefore, there, there's something that you're doing. There's work that you're doing. There's work to be done. And, and maybe you're volunteering. Maybe you don't have a job, but you're volunteering. And therefore, there's somebody that's placed over you. Okay, there's some authority there. There's something going on there. Okay, professionally, you're going to have to live a life of honor. Now, remember when I read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it said, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, right? You know what the very next thing it says? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Take a look at it if you've got your Bible still open there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the harsh. Now, that's an amazing verse, and let me tell you why. Because when he says servants, he's talking to people who were slaves. I know in, in our present-day society, we would say, you know, employees, employers, but let's break it down for a second. He's talking to slaves. If anybody could have been bitter, if anybody could have in their heart had a reason, we would have thought to cry out on justice, and they could have had a bad attitude, and we would have said, that's, that's okay. Because I understand it would have been a slave. Especially somebody who was kept under harsh rulership. Somebody who was beaten. Somebody who had a harsh master that, that verbally abused them. That physically abused them. And we would have said, hey, it's okay. I get it. I understand. It's okay for you to have a bad attitude. But look at what he says. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle. But also to the harsh. What is he saying? Well, he just finished saying, honor all people. So slaves, that includes your harsh masters. Now let's bring it home for a second. Employees, be submissive to your employers. Oh, well, now that just changed everything. With all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. You know, sometimes we, we, we have an encounter with our boss or with somebody on the job that's over us or our supervisor or somebody that, that is in some sort of a position of authority there on the job. And they correct us. They don't like the way we work. They correct us. They say things on, about us. And, and they're really harsh. And we walk away looking at our wounds and we're looking around hoping somebody else will see our plight, see our struggle, you know. And it's almost like we're carrying around the change. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Right? And they're in the break room or whatever, you know, you got the sad face on and your head is down. What's wrong? Oh, don't, don't worry about it. I'll be okay. <laughs> How about this one? Pray for me, brother. <laughs> and what's going on? We're, we're, we're trying to feed this thing. Oh, it's okay. You know what? They were really mean. You know what? They're just wrong. They're just, they're just mad. They just don't like you, you know, or whatever it is. But the Bible says, employees, be submissive to your employers with all fear. Oh, my goodness. That means that when our employer tells us to do something, that we should immediately respond and do it. What if you were a high-level executive at a, at a Fortune 500 company, and your boss came in and said, I want you to go in your suit out into our parking lot, and I want you to go to the planters all around the parking lot, and I want you to pick every dandelion that you can find for the rest of the day. And when you've picked every dandelion for the rest of the day, because you're on salary, you're going to do this till you're done. After you're done with that, you can go home. What's the verse say? Servants, be submissive to your masters. Employees, be submissive to your employers with all fear. That means that they're paying you money to do a job. They're paying you money to do a job. Sometimes people say, well, I'm being underutilized. Man, if they could only use me the right way, the proper way. I mean, I am a well-oiled machine, and they've got me out of my context. You know, this is like, this is like taking the, the lion out of the jungle. I mean, come on. They just don't know what I'm capable of. They need to unleash me. Listen, if they're paying you to do a job, it's time to get busy, time to get to work, time to do it God's will, God's way. And God's way is to honor those that are over you, your employers. Vital, vital for us. It's vital that we honor them. Why? Because it's also a witness. Maybe you haven't thought in these terms, but take a look at it in the Word with me, 1 Timothy. Turn back a couple books to 1 Timothy. 
First Timothy chapter number six. First Timothy chapter number six, verse number one says these words. It says, Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all what? Oh, come on, you guys gotta play tonight. You didn't come just to stare. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all what? Honor. Honor. Why? So that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. What does that mean? That means that when you tell your boss, listen, I didn't get hired for this. I'm not doing it. What do they say? They say, I thought that person was a Christian. They don't believe none of what they teach. They're not a Christian. They're a hypocrite. But when you operate in humble submission to your earthly masters, now all of a sudden you make the doctrine of God, the teaching about God, wonderful. You, you make it attractive. I remember I, I worked on a job. I worked in an in a, in a auto shop. We were doing oil changes and tire changes and all that kind of stuff. And, and so there in the auto shop, there was a bunch of guys, a bunch of fellas, you know, and when guys get together, a bunch of unsaved guys, man, dirty talk, dirty stuff going on, all this stuff, people talking bad about the boss, this and that. And the boss was a really actually a good guy, you know, just average, nice guy. I remember I got on the job, and me and one other guy, man, this, this other guy, Christian brother, man, and, and, and he found out I was a Christian. I found out he was a Christian. We just latched onto each other. And as we did, man, there were days that they would tell us, okay, you're going to go down in the pit. And the pit was the place where the oil went, right? It was not the fun place to go unless you wanted to slack off and really not do too much, right? But otherwise, you were going to come out of that pit looking like the pit, okay? I mean, you were just soaked head to toe in, in grease and oil. That was just how it was. Hopefully you wore dark underwear because it was getting all the way down to your underwear. <laughs> and so here we are in this place, and I remember the boss, man. The boss would come through, and he'd have this mean expression on his face. And what are you doing? You get to work, man. Clean that up, and I, that's not going on in my shop, you know. And he ran the place kind of like a, you know, a drill sergeant running through, you know, just getting guys going and doing this and that. And there on the job one night, the shop was about to close, and, and I was the last guy in the shop, and I was mopping up, and somebody came in, and they were on their last leg of a trip, and they said, listen, our tire just blew out, man. we gotta, we got to get a tire done. Can you do it? And I said, well, I'm closing the shop. And they said, listen, we're not going to make it to our destination if you don't do this tonight. And so here I go. I said, okay, well, here, let me do this, you know. And so I go, and I, and I did something. I went above and beyond. I, I stayed extra time. Remember my boss came through. And they were doing inventory that night. And he comes out, you know, and he's been sleeping all day because they're going to stay up all night and do inventory. So here he comes and he says, what is the shop doing open? And I'm going, okay, here we go. I'm going to get it right now. I'm going to get it. And I said, well, these guys had a trip, you know, that they were going on, and I just couldn't say no, and I just want to make sure that they got to their destination tonight, so I changed the tire and, and you know, just, uh, just go ahead and do what you need to do. Come on, bring it on. <laughs> and he said, Okay. Good job. And he went away. Now, in a couple of months, I was going on a mission trip. I was going overseas. And so I put in my two weeks' notice. And that boss came to me and he said, Wait a second, what is this? I said, That's my two weeks' notice, sir. He said, No, 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 no. You are not giving two weeks' notice. I said, Yes, I am. I'm leaving. I'm going to preach the gospel all over the world. I'm, I'm taking off. There's no way you're keeping me here. He says, but how long are you going to be gone? Forever? I said, no, three months. He said, after three months, you come back here and you get your job back. Now listen, what am I saying? All because of honor. Didn't want to let me go. Didn't want to give me up. And even though the man wasn't a Christian, he said, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. I, I look forward to seeing you when you get back. See, honor will unlock something, especially inside of somebody who's an authority or somebody who's a boss. They want to know that you're listening, that you're respecting them. They've worked hard to get where they're at. You don't know the context of their life. And therefore, when you come in there and you honor them and you do whatever they ask you to do, as long as it's not sinful, hello. And when you work hard, you work extra, you put in the extra effort, you put in good words, encouragement, all that stuff, honor, what happens? The name of God and his doctrine is not blasphemed. 
Amen. Can't tell you how many times on the job I've heard people tell me this as well. That when somebody has a problem, they're the first person that they come to with that problem. Why? Because they want prayer. Because they see that they're a Christian and they know where to go for the answers. Can you say amen? Living a life of honor publicly, professionally, finally personally, personally. And I believe that there's some things very practical for you tonight. Personally. Personally. Our relationship with God is a personal relationship. Therefore, in our personal life, we have to live a life that honors God. And, and in that personal place, see, what, what goes on in here is what comes out here and what comes out here. If there's something going on in your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth. Just simply how it is. If you've been watching a lot of a certain type of movie, you're going to start talking about that type of movie. Right? If, if, if you like sports, you're going to talk about sports, right? Because whatever's going in here, whatever's going on in here is going to come out of your mouth. You're going to talk about it. And, and it's also going to come out in your actions. People that like to watch sports and like to, you know, man, when it comes time for a game at the, at the picnic or the barbecue, or whatever, they're out there playing the game. Even if they're no good, right? They're playing the game. Why? Because they're reliving those moments. And so in the same way for you and I, we have to take a look at our personal life. We have to take a look deep into what's going on in our heart and see, is, is, is my life honoring? Is, is my life honorable to God? Is my personal purity, am I walking in a way that's honoring God? What am I watching? What am I listening to? Where am I going? What am I doing? Where are my eyes going? All those things, these are things that we need to consider. What am I reading? What sort of internet sites am I looking at? All those things pay, play a part in your personal honor. How about in marriage? Marriage is a place, personally, if we're talking about our personal life, marriage is a part of our person because the two shall become one flesh. I know we're kind of zeroing in on some marriage things. Some of the singles might be saying, well, I feel left out. Well, listen, you may get married in the future or you know people that are married, so you can minister this to them. But in marriage, how about for the husbands? There in 1 Timothy, turn back with me to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Great verse for the husbands in 1 Peter chapter 3. Speaking to the husbands and the potential husbands in the future. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse number 7 says these words. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, the them that it's talking about is your wife, with understanding, giving honor to the wife, as to the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, sometimes people look at a verse like this and they say, what is it talking about? You know, that's said a lot. That was a mouthful. What, what is God saying? Well, husbands, dwell with your wives with understanding. Or live your life in a way, you could, you could say it this way, live your life in a way that the woman understands. Okay? Because how many of you know men trying to understand women? That's a little bit difficult for us. We are simple beings. And the woman is a complex thing that God brought to us. I, I'm giving a compliment here. This is not a slam, okay? I can feel arrows and darts. But men are supposed to live in a, in a manner that there's an understanding going on. That means, men, you have to communicate. Men, you've got to open your mouth and say more than you want to say. I often tell the young couples that I meet with for premarital spiritual guidance, I say, husband, when you feel like you're talking too much, that's just the, the minimum that she wants. <laughs> That'll satisfy about here, the minimum amount. So, so talk a lot. Express what's going on on the inside of you. Tell her how you feel, and not just one-word answers like, good. <laughs> I know men love the headlines. Women want the article, right? <laughs> but men, it's time to start writing the article to your wife. Why? Because she needs that. She desires that, especially if she's been at home all day. She wants to know what's going on outside of the four walls and outside of the four kids and outside of, a, you know, there's just the four meals that she prepared. You say, four meals, and there three? Well, there's snack in there, too, okay? So that's a lot of work. <laughs> so dwell with your wives with understanding. Giving honor to the wife. 
See, men oftentimes want the respect. We want the honor. The woman should cater to me. Why? Because I'm the man. I'm the head of this union, right? And we get on these soapboxes, but God flips the switch and turns it around on us and says, no, you give honor to your wife. Treat her the way you want to be treated. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Now, this is talking, not talking about privilege in the kingdom. Once again, this is just talking about that physically... If you look at how a man is built and how a woman is built, most of the time, they're the weaker vessel. <laughs> Can you tell I'm treading lightly up here tonight? <laughs> the eggshells. Because I don't want to do an arm wrestling match with any of the women after this message tonight, okay? <laughs> Next part of the verse, please. And as being heirs together, the grace of life. See, men, you have to remember that in the kingdom, there's no longer male nor female. You've got to remember that God gave everybody a level playing field in the kingdom. And, and can I say this, men, without offending your ego? Oftentimes, the woman that God gave you is going to be the vessel that God speaks to you through. And you would do well to listen to your wife. I can't tell you how many times... Okay. I can't tell you how many times listening to my wife has been the breakthrough in my, my walk with God. How many times has been the breakthrough in our family? How many times has been the breakthrough in our finances? How many times has been the breakthrough in, in our ministry? I mean, my wife, when we first started the young adults ministry here at The Rock, I remember we'd be greeting people, you know, and just mixing it up before service, saying hi to people and shaking hands and this and that. And, and, and some girl would come in and, oh, Pastor Dan, hi, it's nice to meet you. And I'd say, hey, great meeting you. What's your name, this and that, you know? And they'd leave and Jess would come up almost like, you know, You know, like, like Batman or something, you know? It's just, she wasn't there, and then all of a sudden she's there. Bang, you know? Right there in my ear. And she'd be like, you stay away from that one. Now, I'm naive. I don't know anything about that. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I never saw the look. I never saw the, you know, none of that stuff. But apparently that little thing was eyeing me. And she noticed it and told me, you, you, you don't know. You stay away. I said, yes, ma'am. See, but men, sometimes we, being the leaders that we are and the, and the driven as we are and the, the desire for respect, things, I don't want to listen to nobody. You know, well, listen, God gave you that woman for a reason. She is your help meet. That means she is fit to help you out. And brother, you need help. <laughs> Take all the help you can get. Because if you're dull to the Holy Spirit, she's going to nag you until you soften up. Have we said enough to the men? Okay, how about to the wives? Uh, Ephesians 5.33 in the Amplified. I know how the women like more words, so I thought I'd use the Amplified Bible. <laughs> I'm going to need security when I leave. <laughs> just, just have them usher me straight off the platform. <laughs> Amplified Bible, Ephesians 5.33 says, However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband. See, men are looking for respect. Women are looking for love. The Bible tells us that. It, women, let me give you a secret. You tell your man you love him, he'll say, thank you, I love you too. That's just it. He knows you loved him because you married him. And so for him, he settled that issue. Okay? Men are simple beings. Okay? And, and, and ladies, if you need him to tell you more that he loves you, tell him to tell you more. Because he will. Okay, men are simple, right? 
But, but if you tell a man, ladies, this is where I wanted to get. If you tell a man I love you, you, you you'll do, you know, thank you. I love you too, right? But if you, if you stop him, get a hold of him, get, get his eyes looking in your eyes. And, and find something that he did that you respect. And you get serious with him and you say, I respect what you did there. I respect how you took care of the kids. I respect how you made dinner because you knew I had a tough day. I respect how you go out there and work hard. I respect how you keep this place neat, how how you take care of the lawn. I respect how you take out the trash. I don't even have to ask you. I respect, and, and, and I'm not trying to be funny here. This is, this is serious. One time I fixed a toilet in our house. My wife stopped me and said, you are amazing. <laughs> I can't believe you did that. She told me, she said, my dad always called people to fix stuff. You just went and did it. <laughs> my mother-in-law's over there on the front row. Tell me to watch it. So I'm going to leave this way, security. <laughs> but she said, she said, you're just amazing. I can't believe you did that. That's awesome. Come sit. Watch your favorite show. I'm going to make you dinner. Boy, you better believe I was looking for stuff to fix the, for the rest of the week, right? <laughs> Honey, gates broke. I, I think I need to go get a new post. And You know what? I'm, I'm going to be back. I'm going to go to Home Depot. I'll be right back. See what happened? Respect. Respect. Honor in the relationship. Let's read the rest of the verse. Let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. That's, that's a good word for us. That the men are to honor their wife, give preference. Come on, do something for your wife. Tell her that you love her. Go get the flowers that you used to get when you were courting her. How you won her is how you're going to keep her, men. So if you used to write poetry, it's time to break out the pen and paper again. If you used to buy her candy or, or do whatever, you know, go, go and do those things. And women, look for those opportunities to give honor to your husband, to respect him. How about in our finances? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions. Other translations say with your wealth. And with the first fruits of all your increased, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Sometimes we're afraid of lacking when we give. Sometimes we're afraid of lacking. And this is a hard thing. Remember, we're talking about the personal life. Sometimes people have a problem bringing their tithe and their offering because they think, I want to have enough to pay my bills. I can't do it. But what comes out of your heart is what God says that is going to bless your life. And if you have a heart to give and you bring the first fruits of your increase, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You'll have more than enough. Why? Because you're honoring the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of your increase, with your wealth. How about in your relationship with God? John chapter 5, verse 23 in the uh, contemporary English version says, The Father wants all people to honor the Son as much as they honor Him. When anyone refuses to honor the Son, that is the same as refusing to honor the Father who sent him. God wants us to honor him. Now, you may be saying, well, wait a second. Jesus also said, I don't receive honor from men. Really, the word there is the opinion of men. I I don't care about what people say about me, Jesus was saying. I I don't care what you say. I don't care about your opinions. But he does want honor. He does want, the, the word denotes adding weight to or value to right? If you value Jesus Christ, then you're valuing the Father, your personal walk. So what's the conclusion of the matter tonight? We should have the same attitude as Jesus had. Who cares what people say? Who cares? They're going to call you a, 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 what is it, a kiss-up. They're going to call you a kiss-up on the job when you start honoring your boss. You used to be a part of the clique at the coffee pot, but now all of a sudden you're not doing that anymore and you're speaking encouraging words to your boss that everybody hates, you're going to be called a kiss-up. Well, well, what about, you know, in, in the heart thing? Yeah, you're going, to, you're going to see that it might be tight if you start tithing, start testing the Lord. You're going to see that happen, but there's a promise attached to that. We should have the same attitude as Jesus. Honor the Son. Therefore, we'll in turn be honoring the Father. Last verse for tonight, John chapter 12, verse 26. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. 
And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. The greatest honor you're ever going to receive is the honor that comes from God. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on. Give him a great big praise. I want to talk to some of you guys before you leave. Just want to make sure that your heart is right with God. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God tonight, sang some songs, had a good time in the word. I could tell you really got something out of the word tonight. You guys were wonderful. Thank you for allowing me to, to minister that to you tonight. But it'd be a tragedy if we had such a good time in the house of God. We walked out of this place and your heart wasn't right with God. You died and went to hell. That's a tragedy. It's not the plan of God. God doesn't want you to go to hell. I certainly don't want you to go to hell. That would be horrible. So come on, listen up. Let's talk for a moment. What makes you think you're going to heaven? I don't think anybody in here wants to go to hell. That'd be foolish. We know that it's a terrible place of torment for eternity. And, and therefore, most people don't have a problem saying they're not going to hell. But what makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you've been good? Is it because you changed your behavior? You used to be bad, but now you're good? You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. So come on, listen up. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you went to church as a child, raised in church? Parents took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child. Maybe it's because you were born in America, the Christian nation, and everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religion. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents take you to church, call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, that that's what qualifies you for heaven. And you're saved on your way to heaven, denying hell. It doesn't work like that. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven. Love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, I'm going to go to heaven because, you know, I, 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 you know, go to church on a regular basis. I mean, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am in church right now, Pastor. It's great. I'm glad you're here. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work. Any more than you can sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Just a person sitting in your garage. So you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You might be thinking, well, okay, hold on a second, because not only have I attended church, I, I've gotten involved in church. My last church, I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader, and therefore, uh, I, I'm a Christian. It's great. I, I'm glad you did those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible? It's not there. No one in the Bible say get involved in church, help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, that you get to go to heaven simply does not work that way. God is not looking for a membership card to a church when you enter the gates of heaven. And if that's how you think you're going to make it, I love you and respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not going to make it. Come on. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, I'm going to go to heaven because I know God. I mean, I celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life, sing the songs at Christmas. I, I, know, I know scriptures. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. Therefore, I know God and I'm a Christian. I get to go to heaven because of that. Problem with that is, have you read in the Bible where it says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They're not Christians headed for heaven. They know who he is, but they're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus Christ is, believes that he's the Son of God, quotes scriptures in the Bible. Wow. Doesn't make him a Christian, qualify him for heaven. It doesn't work like that. Everybody look up at me for a moment. This is not about what you have in your head. Not about having mental assent or head knowledge about who God is and that gets you into heaven, but rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's looking for your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know in our society, people have made a mockery out of that. They've, they've raked it through the coals, but this is not about what society says or pop culture or any of that stuff. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, here's what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking. 
And he says these words. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? What does lukewarm really mean? Well, here's what it means. It means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, tonight, you can give God all of your heart and all of your life simply acknowledging your need for Jesus by raising your hand in a moment. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it, put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I loved you, honored you, and respected you enough to tell you the truth. God's already done his part, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or anywhere around the world online, right now by our live stream, get ready to get your hands up. God sees you right where you're at. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Got you. On this side, there's three. God bless you. Real quick, where are you at? Four, five, got you guys down here. Up in that family room, is there one back there? I already got them, thank you. There's five wise people on this side. Thank you, six, seven, God bless you. Real quick, anybody else? Eight, thank you. Nine, thank you. Where are you at, number 10? Number 10, thank you. Number 10, got you right there in the striped shirt. Thank you, God bless you. You can put your hand down as well. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Need to give God all your heart and need to give God all of your life. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, just raise it up high and let me see it. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, there's 10 wise people. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. All right, all 10 of you, or if you're number 11 or you're number 12, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a cheer. They're going to sing a song. As we do that, I want you to get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, maybe a friend if you need a friend. Okay? And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, you're one of those 10, or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, you can come too. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Meet me in front. Come on. Let's welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on. Won't you come Hallelujah. Just as you are. If your children raise their hand, come on, bring them down. It's okay. Don't you the spirit. They're coming, come on, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. Oh, come just as you are. Hallelujah. Come, come on, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You just come right now. Make your way to the front. Come and live forever. Hey, everybody. So good that you guys came. So happy for you guys. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. The hard part of getting down here is over, okay? You made it. 
Now God's got great things ahead of you. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is the coolest guy in the place, all right? Let's just, let's just put it out there like it is. I know you were thinking, it's Pastor Dave, okay? He, he's going to do three things. I'll let, you, I'll let you know what they are in advance. Okay, number one thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Okay, you're going to be born again. God doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes into your heart when you invite him. And praying that prayer, you're going to invite him in and you're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, all right? Everybody loves getting free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. So that's a good relationship already, okay? He's going to give you a couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. You need to know, now that I'm a Christian, what am I supposed to do, okay? It's easy reading. You can read it in a short amount of time, okay? I would encourage you to get a hold of that and read it. Third thing he's gonna do, he's gonna give you a friend. Yeah, he's gonna give you a friend. You know, we give away friends here at The Rock. That's just what we do, okay? We call them spiritual personal trainers. He'll describe how it works, okay? But basically, here's the thought. Your friends in the world, they're gonna take you back into the world. But a friend we give you in church will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord and get back to church, okay? So, an SBT is that friend. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out into the church service, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go.